Daily Bible Time, Dominic Steele here, and uh, we're on a journey, a uh, 22 chapter journey through Christopher Watkins' book, Biblical Critical Theory. Uh, I'm just reading it through to help me process it better. And um, he said to us at the beginning of chapter 4 yesterday that. Um, there was a real arsenal in the uh, in the scriptures in the whole doctrine of sin and judgment for our engagement with contemporary society and i think that is no more true and especially true with um this chapter chapter five which is my favorite one so far um it's he's titled it sin and autonomy and it's the whole the thesis that autonomy is really the key word that we should be using uh, or could be using um, to talk about sin. And that's an idea that um, I fell in love with when I put together the Introducing God course in 2003. And um, uh, Chris Watkin has shown us in this chapter in much, much deeper and um, more able ways than I had imagined what an appropriate and important word that is. Um, just, of course, um, the, oh, actually, just to do the questions at the end of the chapter. First, he says, hot, tenth, hot take, think of a friend or family member who might be encouraged or helped by something in this chapter. Compose an email or a message. So I've done that. I've sent a text to a friend who I'm encouraging to read this book saying, um, chapter five is my favorite chapter so far. Go read it. And I'm hoping we might talk about it tomorrow. What is meant by autonomy in the chapter? Well, auto means self and nomos means law. And so autonomy is self-law. Um, or as Carson says, it's the de-godding of God. Now, we, um, we amble through the chapter and um, the first big heading is autonomy, dignity, and choice. Um, before then, though, Watkin says, there's a Copernican revolution in thinking um, about considering my own autonomous reason and will to be the most authoritative and reliable guide to the universe and switching that to the position of conceding that if the God of the Bible exists, then his reason and his will are more reliable than mine. Um, this revolution is required in order to get from the unstated and almost uncontested assumption in contemporary society that autonomy and choice are necessary and are of themselves both possible and ultimately good, switching to the biblical view that autonomy, understood in the sense of being independent from God in our judgments and evaluations, is metaphysically impossible and relationally destructive. To know oneself is above all, to know what one lacks, it is to measure oneself against the truth and not the other way around. Um, when you start to understand sin as autonomy, um, it brings to light one of the most treasured dogmas of our culture, says Watkin, the prized and fiercely defended right to autonomous choice. And one of its defining and most powerful defences is to be found in Immanuel Kant's 1784 essay, an answer to the question, what is enlightenment? And uh, Kant says, enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred tutelage. Tutelage is man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. Self-incurred in that this tutelage, its cause lies not in a lack of reason, but in a lack of resolution and courage, says Kant, to use it without direction from another. Have courage, says Kant, to use your reason. And that is the motto of the Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Kant identifies autonomy with maturity and accepting guidance from another he thinks of that as childishness. Um, Watkin points out, well, if you were two equals, maybe you could argue that. But when we're talking about taking guidance from the Creator, Kant allows no difference between taking the Creator at his word and taking a creature at his word. A lack of nuance that is in itself irrational. Um, and yet, the ideology of autonomy has become the cornerstone of much modern anthropology, the dogma of the autonomous modern individual. Uh, we go to Van Til. Van Til reports observing in a railway carriage. I saw a little girl one day on a train sitting on the lap of her daddy, slapping him in the face. If the daddy had not held on, held her on his lap, she wouldn't have been able to slap him. The relationship of this girl to her father is like that of Invictus to God. The poem's very refusal of its creator is contingent on the creator's grace. 
We might think of the little girl supported on her paternal knee, her defiant head held high, shouting, I am my own unconquerable support. I hold myself up no matter what. And the sentiment, well, it's undoubtedly stirring and inspirational, but it bears precious little relationship to the physics of the situation. The girl needs to experience what Paul Ricoeur calls the second Copernican revolution, when the self loses its pretensions to be its own creator and falls over. In just the same way, the ideology of autonomous choice is a delusion. The ideology of autonomous dignity is self-undermining. Undermining. If I have the incontestable and final authority to define my own law, then, the, then there's no one greater than me to render objective uh, any dignity. Next big heading is autonomy, reason and power. And under this heading, um, as well as having profound implications for questions of dignity and choice, the ideology of autonomy that is born in Genesis 3 fundamentally reshapes human reason and human power. Uh, first, says Watkin, the bid for autonomy threatens to bring crashing down the edifice of human rationality. Adam and Eve's action in Genesis 3 is a textbook example of autonomous rationality. They decide for themselves what counts as good and what counts as evil. However, this moment of uninhibited autonomous rationality is radically irrational. In denying that God has the authority to decide between good and evil, they are forced to seek a ground for their judgment somewhere inside the created order. For God alone is outside creation. Everything else, including the serpent in the garden, is a creature and part of the created universe. The problem is that there's nothing within creation with broad enough shoulders to bear the weight of deciding between good and evil because creation itself can generate no normative and authoritative meta-discourse about itself. We can examine the creator in order to find out what is the case, but not what ought to be the case. It's breathtaking. Um, it's so helpful the way Chris Watkin um, spells it out. He speaks of autonomy and the ethic of violence. Autonomy is inherently conflictual and it leads to an agno agnostic society. If no necessary authority greater than me or outside me can challenge my own lawmaking, and if no authority resides outside you either, then fundamental differences between us cannot be settled in a non-partisan and ironic way. The only way to resolve conflict between our two autonomies is on the basis of power. Either naked power, we fight each other and one of us becomes the slave to the other's master, or sublimated power. Um, Augustine's sketch of the earthly city is echoed in Hobbes's Leviathan when he argues it's manifest that during the time men live without common power to keep them all in awe, they are in the condition which is called war, and such a war as it is of every man against every man. <sighs> I, I, I just think I'm, I'm never going to preach on Genesis 3 again without reading this chapter first. It is so helpful for me in understanding. Autonomy and cosmic plagiarism is another heading of what can... The result of sin, alienation and death. And then those study questions. I, I, you've just got to go and read it. Thanks for joining us on Daily Bible Time. See you tomorrow morning, Friday morning. We're going to be looking at sin, anthropology and asymmetry.